Hi, this is Mark Aceto. I use the pronouns he or they, uh, but the one that I'm most interested in is we, because I'm a collaborative artist. That's what I do for a living. I'm a writer and a director of musicals. I am from Bayonne, New Jersey, but raised in a little town called Westfield, and I live now on the Upper West Side of Manhattan by Lincoln Center. Welcome, Mark. It really is a pleasure to meet you. I'm happy to have you. I'm in a new place. You're at home. I mean, it's a it's a great time to be uh, recording on Zoom these days, right? Well, we meet, right? Apparently, we have had an encounter before. <laughs> yes. I knew you looked familiar. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It was uh, briefly because that was back in what year was Day Before Spring? The show, I think, was February of, of 2019. Yeah. Uh, and you auditioned and I apparently uh, did not cast you. Uh, so which, sorry which about happens. that. No, no, which, which <laughs> happens. I, I did a study one time and found that about 95% of my auditions don't go anywhere, you know, which is mm. uh, probably pretty good for us uh, as actors. You know, we, we just yeah, keep going and keep sure. going. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, a 5% su success rate has done pretty good for me so far. So it's, uh, it's more than okay. And now with theater coming back, I'm happy to, uh, to, to see if that uh, trend can continue. But uh, but for yourself, as you said, we met. It was an adaptation of the Day Before Spring, which was a Lerner and Low classic musical. You did another one of their musicals, Paint Your Wagon, coming to it with fresh eyes and and remounting a production, which is is I would have to say different for you because you mostly do your own original works, your humorous works, whether it's books, novels, writing uh, the book for musicals. So doing these other people's works and taking it, was that a different side of your creative energies? That's fascinating. I, it actually did not use a different part of my brain because I, you know, I started out as a writer. I started off as a novelist and a journalist and then uh, almost immediately started teaching. And therefore I was uh, an editing. So I was, I've, I, discovered very quickly that I had a facility for helping other people tell the story that they wanted to tell. But writing for the theater was my midlife crisis. I was uh, 44, my mother had died, I was living in Portland, Oregon, and I just felt like I, the ambition that I had set out for when I was young, I was an actor at Carnegie Mellon, that theater dream I had deferred. So I came back to New York, and started pitching myself as a book writer of musicals. But the pieces that I had with me, uh, my musical Bastard Jones and my play Birds of a Feather, you know, one's this, now it's easier to pitch because it's a kooky rock adaptation of Tom Jones uh, with a multiracial cast. But at the time, this is 2010, people were like, I don't get what this is. I don't understand this thing. Uh, it's before Hamilton. And uh, likewise, my you know, I play about the gay penguins in the Central Park Zoo. It was a head scratcher for everybody as well. So, you know, here I am. I've, I've moved back to New York because I'm from here originally. And I am not getting anywhere in terms of getting meetings, getting people to pay attention to me. And my husband said, you know, you might get further if you pitch yourself as somebody who can doctor somebody else's work. So that happened rather naturally. So for instance, uh, Allegiance, the show that got me to Broadway, happened to be right, wearing the t-shirt. Yep. Not because I'm self-promoting, just because this happens to be the t-shirt I wear when I'm home because they're really soft. The, uh, I had never heard of that uh, show when I moved to New York. And it was already in development at that point. So I was asked to join that team. I never in a million years would presume to tell a Japanese American story. But since I was invited by a, uh, a team that included Asian Americans as the, as the generators of the story, you know, most notably George Takei, but also Stafford Arima, the director. And, and I discovered that I was able to advance, advancing somebody else's work. Likewise with Chasing Rainbows, which is the show that I've written about the adolescence of Judy Garland, which was at the paper mill and Goodspeed. Uh, same thing. That was a show that I was brought into by somebody else. So 
I've pretty much spent the better part of my uh, career in the theater for the last 10 years, essentially making other people's visions come true. So it wasn't that big a stretch for me to take these uh, these two Alan J. Lerner pieces and and make them happen as well. What was interesting about Paint Your Wagon is that I think it really hadn't been done. It hadn't been retreated and you had to like compile some of the music or was that day before spring where you had to like go into the archives and find the music and, and kind of compile day before the spring was a Yeah, day before spring was a heavier edit. It required more of a radical rethink because mm -hmm. it just uh, was a, a less uh, developed work. Paint Your Wagon, on the other hand, I felt just required pruning. It, it's very clear when you really start to work with Alan J. Lerner's work, you can understand that he was a speed freak and so wound tight. This is a man who had to wear white gloves to stop himself from biting his bloody nails. And you could feel it in the writing. You, you could feel the confusion. You know, because I, I started in both cases with a blank page and retyped everything. And there is something about typing other writers' words in your own hands that you, it's almost mystical. You start to feel them in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. It's kind of like, I think maybe the equivalent as an actor when you're playing somebody else, you, you start to just feel them from the inside out. And his, Alan J. Lerner's, like I said, sort of just very, diffuse mind was very clear to me. You know, the best things that he ever wrote were pieces that were adaptations of other people's work, uh, i.e. My Fair Lady and Camelot. So when he was writing original work, he uh, seemed to really struggle. And those, of course, were both original pieces that uh, were problematic. But ultimately, I was really happy with. I, those were both really uh, happy experiences. Yeah, because in their original productions, they didn't really last that long on Broadway. Critically, commercially, they just weren't really the successes that Brigadoon or My Fair Lady or their other works were. So, so yeah, it. I'm sure it was interesting revisiting stuff that really hadn't been done. Like Lerner and Lowe are known for those other pieces, but they're not as known for the two that you got to right. work on. Well, and Day Before Spring was a really interesting experience for me artistically. It was a real turning point because it happened to be one of three pieces that I did in development in that spring of 2019. And each one I directed myself, because at that point I had really discovered that I was just increasingly frustrated with trying to communicate my vision to directors. And at that point I had started directing my own work uh, very happily. And in three cases, you know, two other pieces, as well as uh, Day Before Spring, when I looked at the finished product, it was, when I say it's exactly what I wanted it to be, it is it met the vision that I had for the circumstances. I mean, that was a one week rehearsal period at the York, uh, book in hand. However, it absolutely matched what I had in mind. And it's such a satisfying experience to be able to envision something and then see it realized in the way that you want to. And in the case of that and the other two pieces, the response from the higher ups in the world, the, you know, the, the people who might be able to give it money or move it on to the next thing was identical to the response that I got into my work when I first moved to New York, which was the head scratcher. We don't know what to do with it. It doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so they, it, <laughs> they were by, I guess, by definition, quote unquote, a failure in the sense that they didn't, you know, achieve what, uh, anyone was hoping that nobody went and saw and said, oh my God, I have to give money to this and move it on. You know, it just yeah. didn't happen. And yet what I discovered was I was so much more satisfied failing on someone else's terms, but succeeding on my own than if I had succeeded on somebody else's terms, but failed on my own. And well, that's the same like as said, actors. Yeah, it's the same as actors when we go into the audition room. Uh, most of the time, we don't get feedback. We're not really sure unless we get a call back mm -hmm. or unless we book it. We don't really know how it was received. But we have to have our own kind of self-judgment perception of what it was like in the audition room. And a lot of times, 
All I can know is that, did I accomplish in the room what I set out to do? Did I tell the story I wanted right. to? Did I do the scene, mm -hmm. do the character the way I felt like it should be done? If that resonated, great. If it didn't, you know, then no callback. But I think it's that internal uh, barometer that we have, both as actors and obviously as writers, that kind of dictate, well, this was a success in what I needed to do, whether or not anyone else got it. Exactly. Exactly. So that absolutely uh, has influenced the direction that I'm I'm moving into in my career because at this point I am uh, not actively looking to develop other people's work any longer. I am, uh, you know, strictly focusing on what I can accomplish between now and the time that I die. So that's the uh, the goal, and I think that's something we've all thought a lot about. Uh, in, uh, in the past couple of years, you know, it's, uh, yeah, particularly yeah. someone my age, but, but I think everybody has been really, uh, thinking about what their values are and what their priorities are and what we, uh, want to accomplish and do in this life. Well, this gets us to our first story. Cause we will kind of go back about 20 years or so when you were mm -hmm. writing your first novel, which was how I paid for college a novel of sex, theft, friendship, and musical theater. A, a, a very descriptive <laughs> title. <laughs> and you actually, when the novel came out, you say that you backed away from admitting just how autobiographical it was, and letting fear really guide you instead. So what was it, what parts were autobiographical and what held you back from owning up to these truths in the novel? The basic premise of the book my father marrying a sociopath, not my mother, uh, my, my parents were divorced, uh, who then influenced him uh, to really make a rapid change in his support of me as an artist and uh, refusing to send me to study acting uh, very late in the game. Like, you know, I, when I'm already a junior in, in high school and not at all prepared to find another way to support that, uh, that not to mention, I'd say, you know, uh, so many of the experiences, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, it, the place where it, uh, takes a leap is the, uh, the degree of criminality in which I, I, I <laughs> partook, uh, there are definitely criminal activity in, in the book that I absolutely committed. Uh, and then some that I did not. And the, uh, but at the time, I really was trying to protect my family uh, from that embarrassment. My, my, my father was mortified that I took, you know, the worst moment of our relationship. And, you know, I turned it into a comedy, which was, you know, healing for me. And I thought sort of a fun way of dealing with one's personal trauma because I thought, oh God, nobody wants to read another memoir about some navel gazing artist. But, it it didn't matter. He was, you know, at, he couldn't leave the house for three days. He was really upset. And did he know about the uh, book before it came out? We had talked about it, and it had it had caused some problems. And then it, uh, but he didn't read it until after it sold. Uh, which was at least that was a smart move because then at least he, uh, I was able to say, well, yeah, but it. <laughs> It's in development to be a movie at Columbia Pictures with the producer of Spider Man. So, you know, he, and given that my dad is very money oriented, it was uh, at least then he could say, oh, well, okay, I, maybe I can get my head around it, but, you know, uh, you know, do what you can to, you know, to protect me. Uh, and it, so it just caused a lot of family drama, a lot of resentment, a lot of. So uh, beyond just your father. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, you know, cause it, it had a ripple effect throughout the rest of the, of the family, you know, and, and I understand, I do understand that. I mean, I'd be, what kind of writer would I be if I didn't have compassion for that? You know, I, you know, I'm still the, the acido with the most, uh, Google hits of any other acido. So, I could, it's not necessarily fun to be related to me if somebody is, you're looking for somebody else and they, their life choices are much more conservative or uh, just 
you know, whatever they, they you don't want to be you know defined by someone else that way. I get that, uh, and it it only escalated though because then uh, the the publisher Random House was had just recently had a major lawsuit with Primary Colors, which was the uh, the Bill Clinton Romano Clay, and so they were super nervous so the legal department then got involved and said well how much of your book is true and then i had to write this enormously embarrassing document where i actually went through the book plot point by plot point and described who it was or who it wasn't so the legal department could then determine whether or not i had to change it or not and and this is like you know who i had sex with in high school so <laughs> oh my goodness yeah this is one that'll go in the archive that's for sure and then at that very same time i'm going to hollywood there was a bidding war for the book there were like you know 10 different studios that were interested i did the bottled water tour in uh los angeles where you go from sort of you know studio to studio and there's always somebody there offering you a bottle of water and hollywood is very thirsty so at the same time, I had this manager for about five minutes who didn't work out, but then proceeded to sue me because he felt like he needed a, a, you know, a piece of the action. So now I'm getting a lawyer. I mean, this is all within the period of just a few months. So by the time the book came out the following year, I was just like a knot. I mean, it was it was there. There was so much stress that the. Uh, uh, there's a line that we use in Allegiance, which I didn't invent, but it's uh, the uh, the the nail that sticks up gets hammered first, and that was very much the the feeling is like you know, that what they call tall poppy syndrome, where you sort of you know the, the tallest uh, flower is the one that gets cut, and it was thrilling and exciting, and honestly, there was so much that was great about it. My picture was in People magazine before let me say that again my picture was in people magazine the month before my 20th high school reunion so there was a lot that was really awesome right? about right? it and at the same time seismically disorienting and i found that after you know pretty much like a year publicizing this thing because no sooner is it out and you're doing all of the press and all of that business then you turn around to do the same thing for the paperback i got tendonitis in my right shoulder because i found that i so desperately wanted that success and wanted to please people that i would lean in to to talk to people to you know because the thing about being an author is so much of it is one-on-one -on -one. you're meeting readers at, at readings Sometimes there's only one person at the reading. That's the person you're meeting. So the so I'm leaning in all the time, but at the same time, I'm feeling like I want to protect myself. So I started doing this thing where I, I noticed that I was kind of rolling in my right shoulder to partly because my hearing is better in my right ear. So I would sort of lean in that way. And it was as if I was trying to protect my heart and at the same time want to reach out and you know, a year of that, and it, I like I had several years of physical therapy to fix my you know frozen right shoulder. It, and I don't know whether you know in retrospect, I don't know whether it would have made a difference if I had been more explicit about my uh, what I wrote and and more honest about it. I don't know if it would have made any difference. I think, frankly, the reason that the book is uh, what's called charitably a, a cult classic, uh, which is another way of saying, you know, it, it was not a bestseller. It, uh, but it's, you know, it was very well regarded by, you know, yeah. by many people. It, oh, I lost my thread. Give me a moment. Take your time. I'll, I'll start again. Clearly, I feel emotional about this because I'm 
struggling to describe it. I think had I been more honest about the derivation of the book, I don't know if that would have made any difference. I'm not, I don't think that would have necessarily made, made it sell any better. It might have, I might have gotten more publicity that way. I think I personally would have benefited and I would have done it at the expense of hurting other people, which is a very hard place to find yourself. And part of, I think, the reason why the book didn't uh, become a bestseller is because it is very explicitly gay. And a, if it came out now, it would be very, very different, I think, in, in the terms of the way it would be received. Yeah, I There's, mean, it was just... But even, even now, yeah. Yeah, because 20 years uh, ago, it, it, it almost was a, just a different generation. You know, gay marriage wasn't legal. Most politicians mm -hmm. didn't want to touch the subject. You know, so it was, it was just a different time. And so touching these subjects that you hit upon in the book, yeah, would have, would have seemed either off the wall or taboo or, you know, for whatever reason. But in well, writing... I, I had... A, I had a, oh, go ahead. No, no, please, please, go ahead. I was just going to say, in writing it, though, obviously you started, you know, putting these stories down, some you infused with truth, some you embellished and, and created different stories or different characters. But you you knew what was you know at least the inspiration where it was coming from and then eventually you started submitting it so you knew it was going to get out there did it, did it did it register like eventually i'm going to have to tell people you know what's true what's not or someone is going to recognize themselves in my book did that when did that moment hit you believe it or not not until it sold I was very mindful, very purposeful as I was writing it to keep the voice of what are other people going to think out of my mind. So the only thing I thought about in terms of the audience or how it would be received is I wanted to write the funniest, most page-turning book that I could write. So I was thinking about the audience in that regard, but otherwise I just put it out of my mind because I, I had enough self-awareness at that point, at least to know that once you allow that voice into your head, that it just cuts off the, the creative flow. So it was once it was done and I got out in the world is when I, uh, when I freaked out and it was, uh, uh, like I said, it was hard. The, uh, I had a meeting with my agent and my editor after I wrote the sequel. And they, it was not uh, selling well. I, I contend because they mismanaged it. It was sort of a tree falling in the forest. Nobody sort of knew it was there. But, um, and I remember we went to Joe Allen's after my reading. And we were talking about the book not selling. And we're talking about what else could I be writing, et cetera. And I, I pitched, uh, well, first up, it, it, I, there was a body language from my editor that I recognized, which is when the hands go on the head and they start to roll across the top of the head, you know, from the forehead, you know, actually sort of like from the, uh, from the eyes to the forehead, to the top of the head. As, as he said, I've seen that body language before and they're sort of mm -hmm. shaking their head going, we just don't know what to do with you. And I said, well, how about a book of essays? They said, oh, we've read your essays. They're just too gay. And I said, well, what about David Sedaris? He's huge. And he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, oh, you're way gayer than David Sedaris. And I just thought, and what does David that mean Sedar to him? <laughs> well, first off, yeah, David Sedaris has a lisp and made his name on NPR as a Christmas elf at Macy's doing an imitation of Billie Holiday, singing No Word from Tom from Stravinsky's The Rake's Progress, I mean, which is a pretty gay thing to be doing. 
And and I'm thinking, and I'm gayer than that. Um, but I think what he meant was, you know, you have uh, butt sex in your in your books, and David Sedaris does not. Hmm. Uh, I'm seeing the same thing happen right now with Strange Loop. I'm very nervous that it will not win the Tony Award because of the explicit sex, and that it will uh, is brilliant as it is. I'm afraid that that's going to really freak out the uh, the road producers. This will obviously air after the Tony Award, so then we'll get to uh, hear it. But I can go on the record as saying that personally, the idea of an original piece written by uh, uh, Michael Jackson, is it L. Jackson? R. Is that right? Michael L? R? Michael. Michael. Yeah. I will go on the record as saying that an original piece written by Michael R. Jackson that gets ignored because of explicit gay sex in favor of a musical about Michael Jackson, an alleged pedophile, disturbs <laughs> right. me to the core. I, I'm, I'm very troubled by that dynamic right now. That is, uh, that is not a good look for uh, our industry. So with all the success that was coming from it, you know, obviously it kind of hit you in different ways, some wonderful, some overwhelming. Then there's the whole reaction of your family. So, it, it, you know, your book coming out was hitting many different areas of your life. And I'm wondering if with that success, with that notoriety that came from it, what would you say that you learned from that that you have then carried with you these 20 years since? Unfortunately, it's a lesson that I had to learn more than once. I'm, I'm definitely a late bloomer in all things. And what I learned was the lesson that I had to relearn when I came to New York, which is the power of single-minded focus. I'm a very diffuse thinker. I, I have synesthesia, which is a neurological phenomenon where you associate uh, numbers and uh, words and letters with color. Hmm. Uh, and it permeates everything in my life in that everything reminds me of something else. So it's, uh, my mind is like a, uh, like a pinball machine designed by Salvador Dali. It's a very complicated place to be yeah. all the time and it can be quite exhausting. So single-minded focus is really hard for me. However, I, I'll tell two success stories <laughs> followed by one uh, failure story. And the, <laughs> the first success story was indeed the sale of the book. My husband and I had been running a business that we sold, which enabled me to take a year to not work and finish the book. And we took a huge risk in doing that. And when we sold the business, I said to him, a year from now, I will have sold this book. And a year later, I am so not making this up, on the exact day, we were walking onto the lot of Sony Pictures to discuss the movie adaptation of the book. And that kind of single-minded focus, I moved to New York in 2010, you know, moved back, because like I said, I grew up around here. And I said, in five years, I will have a show on Broadway. And once again, five years, practically to the day, Allegiance opened on Broadway. And what was such a valuable lesson to me about that was I had set that intention. My screensaver for five years was a picture of Times Square with uh, just 2015 superimposed over it. Hmm. Every single day, my focus was on what can I do to get to Broadway? And if whatever I'm doing is not going to get me to Broadway, try not to do it. And I got to Broadway writing a show I'd never heard of when I came up with the ambition, which I think is one of the <laughs> great lessons of uh, visualization, which is that there is power in the focus and you also can't get fixated on how you get there because you never know. How, what circumstances are going to arrange themselves to, to aid you. And I actually don't think it's necessarily even mystical. I think it's more like an organizing principle for your, for your brain and that you tend to 
then make choices based on it, attract uh, experiences to you. And then the mistake that I made after that, you know, shortly after Allegiance opened, which again was a very tumultuous experience because, you know, the show uh, was, uh, uh, was not a success. I mean, we <laughs> basically, we lost, you know, I don't know, $12 million of somebody else's money. And the, uh, don't quote, I don't, I'm not, I don't know if it was 12 million, something like that. Yeah. Many millions of dollars were lost. Uh, and yes, we made a profound impact on a lot of people's lives. And it was a, such a great experience, but it was also, as you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, difficult. And afterwards, though, there was that moment of, oh, now what? And I made a list of goals. And since there were so many different things I wanted to be doing, I, I did not have one single focus. So, and I had a, I have a three and a half year plan with several steps. And when I got to three and a half years later, which was 2019, at the very time that I met you for the first time, I had realized that I had not, I'd made progress in all the things I wanted to make progress, but I hadn't achieved it. And I, what I took away from that was because I hadn't focused on one single most important thing around which everything else could, could revolve. So the last couple of years have been about being able to determine that again. That's a long time to learn a life lesson. That actually really gets us into your second story that you wanted to talk about. And this is where oh, you talk about that you had a, a, I know, you had an interview with Disney theatricals that you say you sabotaged by trying to be irreverent, but instead ended up just looking like a sexist tool. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in retrospect, you didn't have the self-awareness to realize that you should never have been in that room and and that fills you with 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 shame and a perverse sense of pride even about it. And the one thing that jumps out to me in this story that that you wanted to bring up is the I realize I never should have been in that room. It, to for me as an actor, I go into a lot of rooms, a lot of audition rooms mm -hmm. and to me, if I ever felt like that, that would almost demoralize me. What, why did you feel like that you never should have been in that room? It wasn't because I wasn't deserving. It's because I, I was miscast. Yeah. And I miscast myself in that situation. You know, because I pursued it. What had happened was, again, I had moved to New York. I'm here. I'm at midlife. I'm in a very weird position because I've written these books. So I have fans in the theater. I'm not some kid from nowhere. I'm a middle-aged man who has a fan base. So depending on who I'm talking to, I might be their favorite author that they read in high school, or I might be Mark who, and I never know. And like, when I say favorite, I mean like somebody meets you and starts to cry. Somebody is like curtsying and bowing at me. Like you're really like, cr not crazy fan, but like just, uh, you know, really exuberant, exuberant fan reactions. Yes. And I had, you know, and I had some important friends. Uh, you know, at that point, I had gotten to know Stephen Schwartz because he had been a fan of the book. He actually blurbed my second book. So I had entree into the business. Uh, I wasn't coming here like, a celebrity, like, you know, like uh, somebody who can walk in, like, you know, sting and get a show done. But I wasn't starting from nowhere either. So, but like I said, I wasn't getting traction with my own work because, again, I was getting that sort of head scratching, head shaking response of, we just don't know what to do with you. And I, uh, I met a producer who was interested in developing how I paid for college. This happens about once a year. I, it, this, this book has been in development to be a musical, a mini series, a TV show, a movie, a play so many times. And it, and it still has never taken. So this was one of those times. And, uh, this producer, I think very wisely said, 
I think Adam Schlesinger uh, should write uh, the music. Uh, and I thought that's a great idea. Uh, Adam Schlesinger, as you know, who uh, uh, died of COVID very early in the uh, pandemic is the composer of uh, The Bedwetter, Sarah Silverman's new musical, uh, along with uh, you know the, the best Tony Award opening numbers you've ever seen and the like. Uh, but uh, most importantly, the reason I knew him is because he has a band, Fountains of Wayne, which is a Jersey band. So I, I knew his sound. I knew his vibe. I thought that is a really good fit. So he arranged for me to go with him to a concert of Fant Fountains of Wayne down at the Bowery Ballroom. And he said, I'm going to invite my friend who's an executive at Disney Theatricals to go as well. You should really meet one another. So we all met. We went and saw the concert. We had a great time. It was a lot of fun. End of story. Fast forward, I've had a few meetings with, uh, with this executive. Uh, and then she then introduces me uh, to her boss. So I'm, I'm moving up the ladder at, uh, at Disney Theatricals. And we're sitting in the meeting. And he asks you know, just the most innocent of questions, which is, how did you two meet? And she says, oh, it's, uh, we went to this concert together. Uh, the, the, this other you know, person introduced us and took us to this concert uh, to see Fountains of Wayne down at the Bowery Ballroom. And without missing a beat, I heard myself say, yeah, I did cocaine off her ass in the, in the bathroom. <laughs> and <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. I could only imagine her me. face when you said uh, well, that. Do you know, uh, she was still, she still spoke to me in the years to come. We had other meetings. We'd gone out to dinner. She invited me to her house. So I, I think she understood my intent, which I was to be irreverent. And because I'm gay, I wasn't meant in any way to be like some kind of, you know, uh, jerky misogynist thing. And yet... In retrospect, I am haunted by that smile and laugh on her face. And I think now in retrospect, oh, right. That was one of those moments that women have to deal with, with assholes like me, particularly the gay guys who think we can be, we have looser a certain amount of latitude. Things, yeah. yeah, looser with things when in fact we are just as bad, if not worse than uh than any uh, sexist uh, heterosexual man, and the so it, and the but the only thought in, in the moment was, oh my god, do you really not want this job? That's honestly what I thought. I thought, am I? Do I not want to be here? Is that why I'm doing this? Uh, and I've it's it's very analogous to something that I would do on book tour too. And you'll be very pleased to know I haven't done to you, uh, which is I would get on a radio show. I get on a TV show and instantly there'd be this, I don't know, this like sort of subversive part of me that would try to unsettle the host, hmm. like just try to do something that's going to freak them out and make them go, ah, you know, and. And again, the thought afterwards, like, why, why am I biting the hand that feeds me? Why, why am I doing this? Why, why am I trying to announce that I am, you know, a, a renegade uh, and, and not uh, part of that commercial uh, machine? Uh, yeah, and yeah, yeah, what wait, I hold on just one second. Oh, because it, it's making yeah. noise when you move it. So I just want to make sure we get Sorry. that sentence clean. Go ahead. So. I wish I could remember the name the beginning it, of that sentence was. It, 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 you, were, you were talking about being part of that machine. Yeah. I, yeah. Why did I feel the need to subvert these situations in order to assert myself as somebody rebellious who doesn't want to be part of this big commercial machine and yet so desperately want to be quote unquote successful? What, what's going on in my mind that that I'm there uh, and it's taken me so long to finally own the fact that as bougie as I am and as mainstream as I am in so many ways I do have 
a subversive, very offbeat socialist viewpoint, and that I'm I'm not a good candidate for corporate entertainment, even though there's some corporate entertainment that I really enjoy and respect. You know, there's certain I've watched Encanto recently, and I just thought this is fantastic, first rate commercial entertainment that's putting a lot of good in the world in so many ways, uh, not the least of which is that it, it addresses exceptionalism and dismantles exceptionalism. So I, I think that's fantastic. And at the same time, there are, you know, there are far more pieces of corporate entertainment, like I mentioned MJ earlier, that I find enormously troubling and would not want to be a part of. Uh, so well, but, this... but that's 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 the that tug of war that Broadway just is. It, you know, the, for every fun home, there is you know Mamma Mia. You know, it's it, and mm -hmm. and this is the wide range of shows that can be both entertaining or eye rolling or dramatic or you know no one goes to see it. So it, Broadway is is tough because it does have to sell. Because you don't sell on Broadway, it's not going to last. You know, as as you right. discovered, as uh, <laughs> Learner and Low discovered in their musicals uh, that didn't do as well. So, yeah, yeah, Broadway is just this weird little tough market that uh, that can be hard to um, to find that balance. Because you know, you're an artist. You want to make a difference. You want to tell a story that engages, but you also want to have. 1500 butts in those seats every night to make money. Right. It. Right. And it's absolutely, that's a push and pull. I think that every artist feels. And in my time left on the planet, my interest is returning to uh, the fun homes of this world. This is kind of leads very naturally to the, the third uh, uh it's a story, yeah. which is that my uh, I since before the pandemic, I've been very keen on developing uh, low budget art house film musicals. I feel like there is possibly a a a platform and a market for irreverent offbeat entertainment that used to be able to be done off off Broadway or off Broadway uh, that could happen online uh, or you know streaming or whatever whatever that you know, future looks like the because for every fun home every season is typically there's only one there's usually only one sort of arty piece amongst the 10 or 11 or 12 musicals that open that season and you know, Broadway is a zero sum game. It, there's statistically, there has never been a season on Broadway where more than three musicals have run more than two years. So if any season you can, like at the beginning of the season, look at what's going to open or at the end of the season, look at what opened. And I guarantee you two years later, seven out of 10 will be gone. Mm. It's just the way it works. And like, so like baseball and Broadway are the only two places where you could fail seven times out of 10 and be considered a success. So it's, <laughs> and for every fun home, for every Hades town, there's 10 other shows that are just as worthy that don't get into the pipeline to out into the rest of the world because there's no other way to give the imprimatur of uh, of 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 their uh, value. It was a wonderful show, Playwrights Horizons, 10 years ago called The Shags, that I just thought was brilliant. And, you know, it was brilliant. It played at Playwrights Horizons. I mean, that's about as good as it gets. But it can't transfer because it's a atonal punk rock musical that tells a story that is actually quite disturbing. So where does it go? And I've checked on it. It doesn't go much of anywhere. Yeah. And that to me is just so tragic that, that that's the end of the line. Uh, and I, I learned this lesson with uh, Bastard Jones. This leads me to another dual, uh, 
dual failure. I can't even say it's a failure because it was not my fault. But I did. I I in 2017 I took that first musical I wrote called Bastard Jones, which is a rock musical adaptation of Henry Fielding's The History of Tom Jones. And I used whatever capital I'd gotten working on Broadway to be able to raise the money to get it done off off Broadway at the cell. Uh, and it was a New York Times critics pick and it got, you know, glorious reviews and it was it got a lot of a good attention. And yet, once again, I have people scratching their heads going, I don't know what to do with it. However, there was one funder who said, no, I, I could put two million behind this. Mm. And six months later, he was dead. And believe it or not, that is the second time that the producer has died on me. Uh, the first one was How I Paid for College. The producer of the film was Laura Ziskin, who quite famously started Stand Up Cancer in response to her own cancer. So it's like, you know, on top of everything else, of all the challenges you have to have, and then you have to, to deal with the fact that, you know, we're dealing with human beings, you yeah. know. Uh, but, you know, to twice have a dream deferred because the producer died uh, was, a, uh, was a lesson for me in terms of saying, all right, I, I, I don't want to pursue that big money dream. Uh, if I could raise half a million dollars, I or or one million dollars or one point five million dollars instead of ten million or twenty million dollars, I could make a credible low budget film, mm -hmm. which is why I made a movie over Zoom during COVID. <laughs> well, and and the thing is, Zoom brought out a lot of us. I mean, podcasting. Went and mm -hmm. went up because people were at home and they wanted to record something. Streaming, mm -hmm. zooming, all these different mediums then started to be more tangible to us and more useful. So, I mean, it 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 kind of helped, spurred us all to figure out a new way to do thing. I, I assume that was yeah kind of what led to it for you. No, actually, no, because it actually well, yes and no. Yes, it, the pandemic spurred it, but not in the way you would think necessarily, because I had actually been pushing for this dream for a, a couple of years prior. Once that producer died in 28, uh, right before uh, 2018, I said, you know what? Forget it. I, if I'm going to raise a million dollars, I don't want it to be for an off-Broadway show that I'm dependent on people having to leave their houses to go see. And if it gets a bad review or it snows, nobody goes. I, I'm going to take, I'm going to raise a million dollars. I'm going to make a movie instead because you can make, I was taking my, I'm taking a page out of low budget horror, which is one of the most successful, uh, profitable movie making genres because you can make them so cheaply because you can film them in one location. You know, there's a reason why the saw, uh, the calls coming from inside the house. And that's because all you need is a house. So I thought, at least for the kind of musicals I want to write, they take place in a surreal psychological landscape. They don't require, in fact, I don't even want all those big production values. And what's more, most people look at entertainment on their digital device. So frankly, Julie Andrews on an Alp doesn't look nearly as good as Fre uh, Fred Astaire dancing with a coat rack on your phone. So I. I had been pushing for this and then the pandemic happened and suddenly everybody was, and their brother was, you know, suddenly trying to uh, pivot to Zoom. And I had this, again, bringing up another <laughs> failure. Uh, I've made a whole career out of failing upwards, by the way. Uh, you know, cause I was ahead of the curve when it came to writing about uh, theater kids. Nobody had written a book about theater kids before I did in 2004. And then High School Musical came out. And then uh, Glee came out. And I watched, I was ahead of the curve, and then I watched the wave go without me, and then finish. <laughs> there I was. Uh, and I thought, I am not going to let that happen again. I cannot, I had this idea before everybody else. I, I, I can't watch everybody else 
succeed at this and not do something about it. And as luck would have it, though, it, the pandemic enabled two crucial pieces for me to actually get a proof of concept made. One, uh, Storm Large, who is a, a singer-songwriter and a good friend of mine from Portland, uh, who I had wanted to do this project with for quite some time, but we had never been able to figure out how to do it because she's on the road 300 days a year because she's a working uh, indie singer-songwriter. Suddenly, she is grounded. She can't go anywhere. So she is mine. I can, you know, once the initial weirdness passed, we were able to figure out how to, to get her into a room and film her. And two, because I had some... Uh, some very lovely affluent friends who are big supporters of the arts, who I, I simply said to them, how would you like to put a skeleton crew of 10 artists to work for two weeks? And they said, done. Like the, the idea, because everyone was feeling like, you know, remember, uh, as, you were, as you know, we, everybody was out of work. Mm -hmm. So the idea that they felt like they were art supporters but giving money to an institution wasn't going to do any good at that moment. And they were feeling frustrated that they couldn't do more. And I said, well, let's put 10 people to work. And so that's what we did. We did a, we put together, we filmed it in their basement. I directed it over Zoom, uh, this movie called Mad Woman. And I don't recommend directing a movie over Zoom, but it's what I had to do. And it... Uh, and so was every single person involved it really in their own location they were in their own no 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 this was no they this was filmed under uh uh covid uh safety protocols okay so it was it was you know only a handful of people in the room at any any given time and only one person unmasked whoever was on camera uh but uh but they were in portland and of course we couldn't travel this is june of 2020 yeah so there was no going anywhere so i uh, uh i i you know, i said i filmed it from uh, from here. And, uh, but like I said, that enabled me to be able to actually do the, uh, to, to actually get the film made, uh, which I wouldn't have been able to make otherwise. I don't, it's very hard to get a short film funded because there's no upside to it. Right. Right. Unless it somehow gets on one of those film circuits and then gets some Oscar buzz. Yeah. What, yeah. What's the point of a sword film in that commercial sense? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What was that, that difference? Cause you had been in theater now you're in film. So what was that steep learning curve for you? The steep learning curve for me on this was that I did practically everything you could do wrong. I did wrong. I, <laughs> I talk about failing upwards. I, I just made technical mistake after technical mistake that constantly had to be fixed in post. Now, luckily you can fix in post, but then it was something like, for instance, I, I wanted this inky black background and it wasn't lit correctly to get what I wanted. It was really important to me to get this kind of deep space feeling. And so the producers very generously agreed to fund getting it rotoscoped so that we, you know, which is where you outline the, uh, uh, the person, you know, essentially like you would green screen, except it wasn't filmed in front of a green screen, but that can be done afterwards. So we sent all these files to India, uh, to this firm to do it. And they came back and I didn't know what I was looking at. I had somebody else look at them. And then it turns out when I, when we started really working with the files, discovered that we had sent the low res versions, not the high res versions. And that's why they weren't looking good. So I had just wasted $2,000 of somebody else's money for something that I couldn't do anything with. And I had to go back to the producers and say, I don't expect you to pay for this, but here's the situation. And I just want to cry when I think about it. Their names are Rick and Hallie Sadel. They are, uh, they're a married couple. Uh, and I could talk about them forever, but suffice to say, they, they just said to me, well, this is your film school. And I said, yeah, but you didn't sign up to put me through film school. <laughs> right, to educate like, you, yes. Yeah, you know, like that, that was not, 
that was not the deal. The deal was, let's make this movie and get it on to the film festival circuit and use it as a calling card to be able to make features. It was not to, you know, pay for my mistakes. But they they got it and they, you know, you know enabled me to be able to figure out, you know, this, that, and the other way to be able to get, you know, to figure out other solutions. Uh, but it was... It was the, the, I didn't even know how to, I don't have, you know what it is? I, I'm not sure I had sort of the the thesis statement of that whole experience because it, it hasn't finished yet. You know, we're right. just getting out and, and getting it out in the world. Uh, but it was a a definite reminder for me of just how much time it takes to do something at the level it, that you you want it to be accomplished. You know, the three months that Fred Astaire would take to rehearse one dance routine, that's how long it takes if you want to get it to a certain level of uh, excellence based on your own, you know, criteria, obviously. And that's why I really think so seriously about the remaining time I have left because I'm 56 years old. And I know how it is not unreasonable for a project to take 10 years to get to fruition or even longer. So when you start to do the math at my age, you start to realize, okay, so what can possibly get done? It's not like I've got one foot in the grave, but you know, if, if I've got something that could take another 10 years, I really have to think seriously about what I'm going to do with that time. So I find myself kind of going back to that viewpoint I had when I was uh, writing the book or trying to get on Broadway, that focus of, okay, if it's not going to get me towards the particular goal, try not to do it. So well, I mean, if I don't answer your email, you'll know why. <laughs> right. Well, it gets back to that that sense of we only have so much time, we only have so much energy, we only th there mm -hmm. we have limited resources. Yes, it's great to bring people in and 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 have that support system, a community, a team with us, but each of us individually we only have so much to give. And 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 as you say, as you see that end whether it's 70, 80 years old, 90, you know, however far we're going to go, there will be an end. And as you say, mm -hmm. there, there needs to be a purpose as we head toward that end and what that's going to mean and what we're going to leave behind to others. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's heavy stuff. And, uh, you know, people who work in banks or uh, <laughs> real estate or, you know, sort of muggle jobs, I, I think don't wrestle with these existential questions the way artists do. We, uh, and I, I suppose they, you could say they're quite lucky in that regard that they, this is, this is just another day at work for us, mm. what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have it any other way, but it is, you know, it, it is a, I won't say it's hard because it's not, it's hard is uh, being a frontline worker, you know, hard is being in Ukraine. It is complex and complicated and unique though, that's for sure. Well, this, <laughs> this complicated life that you have built for yourself was a joy to listen to. And I appreciate you sharing so many bits and pieces of it with us. So I'm, I'm grateful oh, that you came on you. the podcast. Thanks. Thank you. I feel like it's been a, uh, a therapy session that I got for free. So thank you. <laughs> very funny is that when i googled your name and you know it said you know uh marcasino.com like Mar 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 but then i click on it and it's marcasino.com is it that, and, and, and he's like a photographer or some other kind of like thereby something. hangs a tail um <laughs> i 
<laughs> Again, sort of the, the, I don't know, the price of success, I guess. I, I've had Marcosito.com since 2003 with how okay. I paid for college. Right. And uh, let me think, it was last year. Was it only last year? It was last year in 2021. I went to China to do uh, my second show there, you know, under COVID conditions, which you can imagine was insane. Mm -hmm. And so therefore I was just really occupied and the, uh, the domain uh, expired and I forgot to renew it. And lo and behold, by the time I paid attention to it, somebody else had bought it. And so when I went to look it up, it was, it was Marcosito.com and it was a series of articles about the history of theater. Right. And I teach the history of theater, of, of, of musicals. Uh, and, I, and I'm working on a nonfiction book about uh, the relationship between how musicals shaped history and history, uh, or actually how history shaped the musicals that shaped history. And so I didn't mind so much that somebody had, had bought my domain name. It's annoying, but I thought, okay. But they were, you know, putting these articles in that sort of were basically my identity. And uh, so I complained about it and I had to, you know, do a lot of digging to find it. And of course, it's a blackmail situation. They want you to pay to buy your domain name back and they're like, they'll name their price and all that. And I thought, well, screw that. I'm not doing that. And what's more, you that's fine. You want to keep Marcosito.com, keep it. But you have got to take down the theater content because that, that's actually uh, a tantamount to identity theft. Um, you know, I cc my lawyer, the whole thing. Anyway, lo and behold, I turn around, I look it up again, and now they've changed it to marcasito.com <laughs> with a series of articles on the C, you know, right. El Mar. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I, I have no idea what their end game is. Like, I don't think, it's not like I'm Beyonce, like, what are they, what are they thinking right, they're right. going to get out of me? You know, I, right, right. That was my question. I was like, you know, I mean, you've done well for yourself, but like you said, we're not Beyonce or Tom Hanks. So like, what are no. they hoping to get out of it? <laughs> I just no idea. No well, idea. Well, it's but the same actually, thing. I, with I, the... I kind of love it. I kind of love it though, because I now have a good story. And, you know, now that I have a new website and I'm, I, you know, eventually I'll do the SEO things you have to do and all that to get it, you know, to get that moving along. But it's. Uh, but in the meanwhile, yeah, uh, it's, it doesn't make for a bad story. Uh, well, it's the same thing that people do with their, these social feeds about how someone hacks into the account and then they can't log into it anymore. Someone's stolen their identity, at least online. So like, mm -hmm. like what, what, what are you doing? I have 700 followers. Why are you, why, why do I <laughs> matter to do you? So, well, do you know, I actually had my identity stolen when I was on book tour. Uh, somebody wrote, uh, contacted the person at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon, which where, where I was living at the time, and saying that I'd had an accident and I was in the hospital and I was asking uh, them for uh, if they could send money. So naturally, they, they contacted me and I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm doing the book reading. And apparently there was some uh, con artist who was focusing on authors on book tours. The idea being that, like, if you full, if you contact the, like, you know, the bookstore, and that they maybe that they're related to, I, I again, who knows what the, the idea was, but it, it, but apropos, I just felt like, in some ways, you know, because I've written a book about embezzlement, I, I feel like I'm being scammed by my own characters, like, <laughs> right? these, you know. These are like the people I've invented who are, you know, trying to scam me. So I, I kind of like them in a way. Well, well, I mean, yeah, it certainly takes balls and it takes creativity <laughs> and a lot of energy and time to put into it. So, I mean, I mean, kudos for the effort, but it, it does make you think, why? Just why do you need to do all this? Oh, my goodness. Right.